So, welcome everybody. Let's see if I got this mic right. This is the ninth lecture in my course on the Arahant and the Four Truth in Early Buddhist Discourse. Yeah, there has been a lot of discussion on the blog. Some was very interesting. But much of it was on a topic that we already covered last year, on karma. And, um, yeah, I'm not really going to go through the discussion we had last year again. And I hope you will also forgive if on the blog I uh, don't really get fully engaged in that, because I feel that last year I already said most of what I had to say on this topic, and it's... Uh, it's kind of, I mean, those of you who really want to know what I have to say, you just have to look up last year's lectures. <laughs> I'm not going to go through it all once again. But there was one very nice comment by Olga Gedry Maid, which I think just puts the whole karma topic right on spot for what we need to know. She just says, from the practical point of view, for me, karma is not about blaming others, but about taking responsibility for my own actions. I think that's wonderful. That's basically all we really need to think about, and it fits in perfectly with uh, the main topic of our present, uh, this year's course, and the present lecture, last lecture, the Four Noble Truths. The whole point is precisely to take, to take responsibility ourselves, in this case for Dukkha, and to see that the question is not about blaming others, but about taking responsibility for our own contribution to our experience of Dukkha. That was really nice, so thank you to Olga. Then there was still a comment related to the Dhananjani Sutra. You remember that this course where Sariputta goes to visit that uh, Brahmin and teaches him the Brahma Viharas? This is from Wei Cho. She says, why the Buddha had lamented on Dhananjani's fate. If Venema Sariputta had not only just taught Dhananjani the path to the company of Brahma, but also suggested to him to contemplate how the Brahma Viharas arise, we might have had another Arahant in the world. If we can have the strength of mind to understand that any of the eleven or twelve exalted states, these are the four jhanas, the four Brahma Viharas, and the three, or according to the Chinese Agamas, four non material jhanas, are conditioned and volitionally produced, etc., then we could attain the destruction of the taints. It is the realization of the cause of whatever has happened before in these exalted states, conditionally arisen subject to change, that will push the mind to understanding. I thought that was again a very, very important contribution that really clarifies the whole point that, that we are, we are, we are meant to look at. That whatever type of mental experience there may be, however exalted, deep and concentrated, it's something that is produced by conditions, by volition. And this again relates us back to the Four Noble Truth, as we saw, I think, that this diagnostic scheme of the Four Noble Truth always involves the statement of uh, something followed by its causes and conditions. So it's always this look at, at the conditions that is so, so significantly Buddhist about it. And that, as Wayne Shaw beautifully points out, is also so liberating, if we can see that. Then there were two comments in relation, in particular, to the elephant footprint, the discourse we took up last time. Oh no, that was actually not about the elephant footprint, that was about the discourse to Anata Pindika. This is Rodolfo Rivas Molina, and he mentions that the space element and the conscious element are sometimes listed alongside the four material elements. And he noticed uh, immediately that this is a little different because consciousness is an element that does not really belong to matter. And that is a very, very 
very good uh, and precise observation, which uh, some of our Buddhist monk friends in past time seem to have missed out on. Yeah, so we have the four elements, earth, water, fire and wind, which are qualities of matter. And sometimes this gets extended to describe the whole of experience by adding space and consciousness. And in such context, consciousness stands for the whole of mental experience. It is not just the fifth aggregate, but the whole of uh, mental experience. And it's interesting that in the Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on mindfulness, in the Madhyama Agama version, we get the whole six under contemplation of the body. So there evidently an uh, error has happened because in the Pali and in another Chinese Agama version in the Ekotarika Agama we get only the four material elements. But here uh, somebody has evidently not had the good understanding that Rodolfo has and for some reason during the course of all transmission the four elements which are matter, which fit under body contemplation have been expanded and there we get all six elements, which doesn't fit under body contemplation. And I believe some Sarvastivada Abhidharma text, maybe the Dharma Skanda, I'm not entirely sure offhand now, has actually copied that. So there also we get all six elements under contemplation of the body. But Rodolphe is correct. The six elements can only fit in a context where the question is, to speak of the whole of our experience, not just of the material side. And we are actually going to get the six elements precisely in Madhyama Agama 31, which we are going to study today. Yeah, and then there was a comment by Juliana, <coughs> and uh, she made that comment right at the beginning of the blog, and it really uh, hit me because it seemed a very clear understanding of the teaching given in that discourse. So I just wanted to share that with you. She says, after Sariputta reports the Maxim, that on seeing dependent arising, one sees the Dharma, then the focus moves directly on to the dependent arising of the five aggregates, instead, say, of a more abstract or normative exposition of causality. I think she means the a standard presentation by way of 12 rings. Such a profound and direct instruction for meditation, experiencing and knowing the aggregates, that is to say, oneself, as dependently arisen, dependently arisen and passing away, seeing the Dharma. Yeah, that was uh, very beautifully captured. I, what I think is again from the perspective of insight and meditation, a very crucial aspect of this uh, powerful discourse that we looked at last time. It links very well with what Wayne Cho said about seeing a conditionality. Yeah, that was already all I gathered from the blog. I had, it's not much else. I mean, the, I think maybe the discourse was rather abstract with all this interwining and going down and coming up again of Venerable Sadiputta. That was a little difficult to follow. Is there any question in relation to these uh, two or three points that I raised from the blog, then now is the time to ask, otherwise I'll get into the next discourse. Right. So we are now getting into Madhyama Agama 31, and this will be the last on the topic of the Four Noble Truths, and in the later part of today's lecture we will get into another chapter of the Madhyama Agama with another topic. The setting is, uh, of the discourse is a teaching given by the Buddha to the monks, and it's a very short teaching. In the Madhyama Agama version, the Buddha just says that uh, Tathagatas, uh, this is a term for a uh, fully awakened one and usually used uh, predominantly for the Buddha. Tathagatas of past, present and future times teach the Four Noble Truths. 
In the Pali version, this is the Satcha Vibhanga Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya 141. And the beginning is instead that uh, he says that at the deer park in Benares, uh, he set in motion the wheel of Dharma by teaching the Four Noble Truths. This is what tradition considers to be the first discourse delivered by the Buddha to his first five disciples who had been with him when he practiced asceticism and then left him. And so when he goes after having reached awakening, when he goes back to teach them, he gives them this uh, exposition on the Four Noble Truths. And one of them, they all realize a stream entry, Kondanya, and because he understood Anya, he is called Anya the Kondanya, the one Kondanya who understood. And this understanding then is uh, symbolically uh, expressed with the idea of the wheel of Dharma has been set in motion. While the introductory part differs a little, in both versions, the Buddha, after this short statement, in the one version he says, Tathagata's past, present, future teach the Four Noble Truth, in the Pali version that in the Deer Park he taught this, he says that Sariputta is able to give a full exposition of the Four Noble Truths. And he also says that Sariputta is uh, apparently particularly the one who leads uh, others to stream entry, and Mahamogalana then leads them on to full awakening. Then here comes my personal interpretation of this statement, of which you are certainly completely free to disagree. But the way I understand it is when Masariputta stands in particular for this um, analytical aspect, and when Mahamogalana for the mastery of concentration. So the fact that here he is particularly related to the Four Noble Truths and stands for this analytical understanding. I understand that that Sariputta here symbolizes the need to have some uh, insight into the Four Noble Truths and as the way to reach stream entry and which becomes complete in some way with the, under, with the realization of stream entry. And then for further progress along the path to full awakening, the development of deeper concentration is particularly important. But this is just my, my hold on this. So now the rest of the discourse is taught by Sariputta, and he is now giving an exposition of the Four Noble Truths. And we will start, and uh, I will read the discourse to you. Uh, just before I start, I note that the definition of Dukkha we are getting here in the Pali version is slightly different, but there are similar variations even between different Pali discourses, whether they mention disease or not, whether they mention association with what is liked or not, unable to get what one wants. There, there seems to be some variations in the precise formulation of this definition, but it doesn't make any major difference. So, what, venerable friends, is the noble truth of Dukkha? Birth is Dukkha, old age is Dukkha, disease is Dukkha, death is Dukkha, association with what is disliked is Dukkha, separation from what is loved is Dukkha, being unable to get what one wishes is Dukkha. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are Dukkha. Yeah, then he goes on uh, to give uh, a more detailed explanation of each of the terms mentioned before. This is in a somewhat commentarial style, and uh, as you will later see, we have a third version which I'm going to present to you, which is very short. So uh, it is possible that this uh, later the parts that we are reading now are a later edition of a commentary of the style, just as a possibility to keep in mind. Venerable well, friends, when it is said, birth is Dukkha, on what basis is this said? Venerable well, friends, birth is when living beings in their various forms experience birth, when they are born, when they are brought into existence, when they are formed, when the five aggregates come into being, and when the vital faculties develop. This is called birth. And then after this uh, short um, 
after this, well, it's already somewhat long, but after this first part of the definition, there comes a very long passage that uh, describes all the type of afflictions that one experienced through birth. And this is not in the Pali version, and we get the same passage after each of the following discussions, each of the terms that are taken up. That is definitely a later commentary edition, I think. When we're friends, when it is said, old age is to come, on what basis is this said? When we're friends, old age is when living beings in their various forms become senile, with hoary hair, lost teeth, deteriorating health, hunched body, unsteady step, overweight body, shortness of breath, reliance on a walking cane, shrinking flesh, sagging skin, wrinkles like pockmarks, failing sense faculties and unsightly complexion. This is called old age. It's quite a vivid picture we are getting here of old age. I wouldn't have been able to come out with so many uh, descriptions if somebody had asked me about old age. Wrinkles like bookmarks. Wow. Now we get disease. <clears throat> Venomous friends. When it is said disease is dukkha, on what basis is this said? When we're friends, disease refers to headache, sore eyes, earache, sore nose, pain in the face, sore lips, toothache, pain in the tongue, pain in the palate, sore throat, panting, coughing, vomiting, hoarseness, epilepsy, swelling, hypersalivation, bloody phlegm, fever, emaciation, hemorrhoids, and diarrhea. When these and the various other symptoms of disease arise, they do so independence on contact. They do not arise independently of the mind, though they manifest in the body, such as disease. Yeah, again, a very vivid explanation. And this statement that uh, these symptoms arise independence on contact and not independently of the mind is also without any counterpart in the Pali. So we get a definition of death now. Venerable friends, when it is said, death is dukkha, on what basis is this said? Venerable friends, death is when sentient beings in their various forms come to the end of life and succumb to impermanence, when they die, disappear, break up and are extinguished. When their lifespan is ended, destroyed, when their vital force shuts down, this is called death. When my friends, when it is said, association with what is disliked is dukkha, on what basis is this said? When my friends, with regard to association with what is disliked, living beings truly have six internal sense bases. And when, by way of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body or mind, they sense an unliked object and find themselves together with it, in company with it, associated with it, conjoined with it, then they experience dukkha. It is the same with the external sense object and also with the resulting contact, feeling, perception, volition and craving. This is already a very detailed kind of breakdown according to the six senses and then contact, feeling, perception, volition and craving that we are being presented here. There's a remark by René, I just check. Contact of the body with something is mentioned in Majimanikaya 3, 250. Kaya Sampasajang Dukkanga Satang Vidayatang. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. But what I was, where did I have it? Yeah, this, I was, um, disease, it is, yeah, disease is not there at all, and it comes under dukkha, and it just, it gives us the idea that, uh, kaya sampasajang dukkang, that there is dukkha, uh, in arising through contact through the body. What I meant is, that uh, idea that di disease 
arises in dependence on contact and not independently of the mind manifesting in the body, that this whole kind of explanation is not found in the Pali. But thank you for pointing out that uh, in the definition of Dukkha, there is uh, the Kaya, the, the body is there. And under the Domanasa, then the, we get the Dukkha that arises in dependence on the mind. Rosa, why craving and not consciousness? Um, why craving and not consciousness? I'm not sure, Rosa, what you are referring to now. Ah, there. Okay. Yeah, this is, uh, I think we also get that in the definition of the Four Noble Truth in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, if I don't remember wrongly. I might be wrong. I was also puzzled by that. Craving is sometimes being being treated in a way, even there's a passage, now I can't quote offhand where that is, where there's a question of having a sense of I, me, mine in relation to craving. And um, as as we are going to see with this, no, it's it's not really the five aggregate list, Rosa. That, uh, that I think is being presented here. That, that would actually make more sense in a way. Yeah, you're actually right. I have uh, I have come across this, um, I'd call it intrusion of craving in contexts where I would not expect it, uh, uh, several occasions, and it, it has kept on puzzling me. It seems there is some 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 reason why 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 well, this then builds onto craving, but it does not directly make sense to me. It's good that you pointed out. Because, as you rightly say, to match the match the six senses with the five aggregates would make sense, and then contact could stand for the body, and then we would have consciousness. That would make a lot of sense. But the uh, Chinese term is definitely craving there. Yeah, thanks for noting that. So, living beings, let me just check on the Satipatthana Sutta if I quickly find that. Yeah, there's also. Yeah, it goes. It goes from the senses, and then it goes contact, feeling, perception, volition, craving. Diganikaya, volume. It's volume two, page three hundred eleven. It's the same. It's the same pattern. Then it even continues with vitaka and vichara, initial and sustained mental application. And Vinyana has already mentioned before, you get you get uh, the sense object, the sense, the sense object, the sense consciousness, and then the contact, uh, the feeling, the perception or cognition, sanya, the volition, and then the craving. In in Pali, this is the Pali version I'm quoting for. Yes, yeah, Diga Nikaya, Volume Two, Page Three Hundred Eleven. Mahasatipatthana Sutta, the exposition of the of the uh, Four Noble Truths. And <clears throat> this is the Dukkha Niroda Arya Sachang, the um, noble truth of the cessation of Dukkha that I just happened to catch. Let me just check. Yeah, it's the same also for the rising. So it's the uh, rising of Dukkha and the cessation of Dukkha in the way it is given in full in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, Diga Nikaya 22. And there also we get the Tanha. And this is something that has always puzzled me. Anyhow. <coughs> And and here we get our six elements now. Venerable friends, <coughs> living beings truly consist of the six elements. And when, by way of the earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, or consciousness element, they encounter an unlike object and find themselves together with it, in company with it, associated with it, conjoined with it, then they experience dukkha. This is called association with what is disliked. So this, in a way, gives us a reply to the point raised by Rodolfo that here the question is to, to, to give uh, a, a, an analysis of the entire uh, of our experience, cutting down the material part into the four element plus space, 
and representing the whole mental part just by consciousness. When my friends, when it is said, <clears throat> separation from what is loved is Dukkha, on what basis is this said? When my friends, with regard to separation from what is loved, living beings truly have six internal sense bases. When by way of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body or mind, they sense a loved object and find themselves separated from it, not connected with it, divided from it, not associated with it, not conjoined with it, then they experience Dukkha. And here we get again the same with the external senses, contact, feeling, perception, volition and craving. And then we get the same for the six elements. Yeah, I skipped that para and I continue with the one at the bottom. Venerable friends, when it is said being unable to get what one wishes is Dukkha, on what basis is this said? Venerable friends, living beings who are subject to birth, who are not free from birth, wish not to be subject to birth. But this truly cannot be achieved by mere wishing. Living beings who are subject to old age, death, sorrow and lamentation, who are not free from sorrow and lamentation, wish not to be subject to sorrow and lamentation. But this cannot be achieved by mere wishing. And my friends, living beings who are actually experiencing pain, which is unpleasant and disagreeable, think, I am experiencing pain, which is unpleasant and disagreeable. I wish this would change and become agreeable. But this too cannot be achieved by mere wishing. When my friends, living beings who are actually experiencing pleasure, which is agreeable, think, I am experiencing pleasure, which is agreeable. I wish this could last forever, remain and not be subject to change. But this too cannot be achieved by mere wishing. The same then for intentions and perceptions that are agreeable or disagreeable. <coughs> when my friends, when it is said, in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are dukkha, <coughs> On what basis is this said? They are the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. When the friends, when it is said, in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are dukkha, it is said on this basis. When the friends, the noble truth of dukkha was in the past, the noble truth of Dukkha will be so in the future and is so in the present. It is generally true, not false. It does not depart from the way things are. It is not distorted. It is generally true, exact and valid. It is truth that accords with the way things are. It is what the noble ones are endowed with, what the noble ones know, what the noble ones see, what the noble ones comprehend, what the noble ones attain, what the noble ones fully awaken to him. For these reasons it is called the noble truth of Dukkha. Yeah, this whole para here is not found in the Pali version that they were so in the past, future and in the present. And um, this detailed um, explanation why the Four Noble Truths are called Noble leads us to a question that I think René had already raised uh, last time and uh, I'm now showing you the parallel, the third parallel that we have beside this Madhyama Agma version and the Satya Vibhanga Sutta in the Majjhima we also have an Ekotarika Agama discourse. Now the Kotarika Agama is problematic. In a way sometimes we get uh, discourses that seem to be very early but as a whole the collection has uh, clearly suffered from later interpolations and this is in fact a topic I'm at present also researching on and uh, there are a number of uh, clear Mahayana interpolations in this uh, collection, 
So it's something to be taken with a, with a certain kind of um, dose of now, suspicion is maybe not really the right word, but nothing better comes to my mind. We have to always a little bit look if the presentation that the Ekotarik Arma gives us makes sense. But in the present case, I have the impression, again, this is my personal impression, that what we could be having here is a very early presentation. So, the entire discourse, is that much, you see? can almost get it on one one page. And what we just went through in the Manyama Agama is just the first part, just the first part of the Manyama Agama version. And if you look at the Pali version, I mean in the PTS edition, it's one, two, three, four, it's five pages, it's much longer. Anyhow, we just have a short look. <coughs> what is the truth of Dukkha? That is to say, birth is Dukkha, old age is Dukkha, disease is Dukkha, death is Dukkha, dejection, sorrow and vexation are Dukkha, Association with what is disliked is Dukkha. Being dissociated from what is liked is Dukkha. Not obtaining what is searched for is Dukkha. In short, the five aggregates of clinging are Dukkha. This is called the truth of Dukkha. What is the truth of the arising of Dukkha? That is to say, it is the fetter of craving. <laughs> Very short. What is the truth of cessation? That is to say, the truth of cessation is the final and remainless cessation of the fetter of craving and lust. This is called the truth of cessation. What is the truth of the path? That is to say, it is the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right effort, right livelihood, right action, right mindfulness, right concentration. This is called the truth of the path. Very succinct. Before I go into this, let me see, there's a comment by René. René, in the beginning of the discourse MI30, I saw not all truths were called noble. Does that differ in different traditions? Could you imagine a different translation such as of the Noble One? René, that's precisely the point I'm uh, just about to get into. That's very good that you remind us of that, but that is precisely what I'm, what I was, what I'm up, up to. You see, we were just showing that here there is a number of explanations in the Madhyama Agama version why they are called Noble. The Noble Ones are endowed with this, they know it, they see it. And now in this very short discourse here, you see, what's the truth of Dukkha? Not the noble truth. What is the truth of the rising? Not the noble truth. That's precisely what I'm uh, so intrigued about. And I'm just going to go to to see if we find uh, other, as you said, if, if there are different traditions on this. But let me just check what Rodolfo has. Rodolfo, consciousness element means that consciousness exists as external as an aggregate is conditioned and arisen by the other aggregates. How is it that exists as an external element or object with which you can make contact? Uh, Rodolfo, I don't think the point was to say that consciousness exists ex external. Uh, consciousness has um, different meanings according to context. And one is as the fifth of the five aggregates. But another usage of the term consciousness in the early Buddhist discourse is to represent the entirety of the mind. In such usages, one in Pali would be, for example, an expression that says, sa vinyana kekaye, the body with consciousness. And that refers to the entirety, so if, of, if, uh, entirety of your experience. Here consciousness covers all the four mental aggregates. But there is no question about this being external in any way. And each of these types of consciousness is conditioned. There's no question of it being unconditioned. And it's not an, an external element. Yeah? It's just, uh, there are different ways of uh, analyzing experience. And the most common one we get is by way of the five aggregates. This particularly pins down those five aggregates of our personality that are specifically prone to be latched on as I, me, and mine. But there are sometimes alternative perspectives, and for some this might work better. So there is this alternative perspective by way of the six elements, which keeps the mind very simple. It kind of uh, squeezes it all together under this one label of consciousness, but does a very detailed analysis on the material level. 
And for some, this may, this may work better because the uh, material element is what they cling to and that needs to be more analyzed or it's just more prone to their type of approach. Yeah, I think I wait for further comments on this before I go into the novel. So, René, if you uh, give us a little time, we come back to the to the nobility. <laughs> I was not aware of the different context Rudolf says. Yeah, you 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 cannot. I mean, this is just when you when you read the suttas, you see that th these things are sometimes used in slightly different ways. But it's very good that you're bringing this up, so we could clarify that. And as I said, you, I'm not sure if you were already there when I said that you were sharper than some of our ancient Buddhist uh, monastic uh, friends because I said in the. Mayama Agama parallel to the Satipatthana Sutta, the whole six elements are put under the body, which doesn't work because consciousness is not material. And you notice that right away. Lechan, what we call a being or an individual or I is only a convenient name or a label given to the combination of these five groups. They are all impermanent, are constantly changing. Whatever impermanent is dukkha. They are not the same for two consecutive moments. Here A is not equal to A. They are in a flux of momentary arising and disappearing. Is it the meaning of the five aggregates? <laughs> Le Chang, I almost completely agree with you. Only the one statement I have a slight um, footnote that I would like to make. <clears throat> they are in a flux of momentary arising and disappearing. I may have touched on that earlier, the conception of change in early Buddhism is not momentary. Things change every moment, but they do not disappear every moment. The idea that everything disappears every moment is a later development found in all Buddhist traditions, as far as I know, and very strongly influencing especially Abhidharma commentarial traditions, and therefore also a very strong influence on modern vipassana movements but the conception of change we get in the early discourses is um, i think I, I gave that example it's like a river there's a continuous change but the river does not disappear and appear disappear and appear whereas the conception of impermanence uh, from the momentary perspective is like a light a choo, 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 choo. it's there gone there gone. <laughs> you kind of get my idea. And that is different. So the conception of the five aggregates that you are uh, pinpointing now is precisely that a being, individual, or I is just a name or label to the combination of the five aggregates and they are impermanent, they constantly change. And because they constantly change, they cannot give us lasting satisfaction. They are dukkha. And they, they, they keep on changing all the time. So they are in a flux of change, but they do not disappear at any moment. That is the only slight uh, change that I would make to your very nice presentation of the significance of the five aggregates. Yeah, so now we get into nobility. As I said, the uh, Ekotarika Agama version on its own is not sufficient evidence for us. But I, I researched it and I found quite a number of other passages where uh, nobility is also missing. And there's also um, a problem uh, when we look at the Pali uh, text and here what I have given you here in Pali <coughs> is the, excuse me, is the uh, is the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta the discourse that according to tradition is the first exposition of the Four Noble Truth, and uh, here is now the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. This noble truth of the origin of suffering is to be abandoned. There's something a little. The translation is a hundred percent correct, but there's something puzzling there, and I was very proud uh, last year in the. Uh, course I taught at the University of Sylvester, who is actually also here today, he immediately pinpointed this problem. I thought, wow, <laughs> he spotted it. Th that doesn't work, no? What should be abundant is the origin of suffering, but not the noble truth. 
right? And this problem has been pointed out by Weller. Pohui, I come back to your question later. I first want to get through with what I'm having now. I'm just giving you here the uh, bibliographical information. And then later on, this has been taken up in quite detail by K.R. Norman. <coughs> and here we have a. Ah, oh yeah, I have given here all the references. Woodward, this is also a, a translator of the Samyutta Nikaya, the earlier translation by the PTS. He already makes points this out in note that the Arya Satcha, the noble truth, uh, has to be taken out. He says, but we must omit Arya Satcha, otherwise the text would mean the Aryan truth about the rising of ill is to be put away. And uh, Weller pointed this out, I have given the reference already. He also points out that there is a grammatical problem there. I know I shouldn't be getting into Pali grammar, so I'll be very short on this, and um, we are not going to go very much further into this. But the correct form would not be Dukkha Samudha Yang Arya Satchan, but Dukkha Samudha Yo Arya Satchan, and Dukkha Nirodu Arya Satchan. And I, uh, forgive me for going a little bit further with this, but I just have to briefly present these things. Norman then he develops. Uh, 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 explanation that the ending ang came because uh, uh, hiatus is means when, when, when two vowels meet each other, that, that doesn't work. No, I, I think we forget about this. That's getting too, too much into Pali grammar. I mean, this is here in the text. For those of you who are interested, uh, you can look it up later. But what he basically comes up as a result of his exploration is that what the original statement was just that pain or dukkha should be known, its origin should be given up, its cessation should be realized, and the path to its cessation be practiced. So what we have here is that the entire expression noble truth has apparently been added in the Pali, and all these observations by Woodward, Weller, and Norman were based entirely on the Pali, on, 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 on looking at the Pali discourses. And I have written a paper on that. Again, any of you who likes to get into that, then you send me an email to the Madhyama Agama address, and I'll send you that paper. I have found that in a number of other texts, not only our Ekotarika Agama version, the noble qualification is missing. And so, what I, uh, the way I interpret that is that I'm not saying that noble is in itself uh, totally late, but I assume that it was at the outset not used every single time when there was a reference to the truth. And one passage where it must have been used, and I'm giving you here the Pali, uh, is this passage here. It says the Tathagata, the Daskon one, is noble, and therefore the truths are called noble. So in this uh, this passage, it the whole statement would not function if noble would not be there. So the way how I put this together is that in the beginning, noble was used in this particular context. We do not have a Chinese Agama parallel to this particular discourse, but that doesn't mean that the other traditions did not know about this type of discourse, because the Agamas are not complete. We don't have a complete Agama set from one school. So I assume that at the beginning there was uh, the qualification noble was used in a specific context to make a specific statement. And later on, the qualification noble doing oral transmission came to be used for any kind of occurrence where there's a reference to the noble, to the truths. Yeah, right, there's a number of questions now, and I anyway wanted to give a little bit of space for discussion at this point, because 
for some this is a, a little bit uh, unexpected who they're taking the nobility away from the for truth but actually we are not taking the nobility away we are just uh, showing how a qualification that i believe was to some degree original in a specific context came to be applied to all occurrences and if my hypothesis this should be right, then they are called noble because uh, they are discovered and taught by the Buddha, the Tathagata. That would be the explanation why they are noble. Right, so before I come back to this now, first there was a question by Po Hui. What is the difference between changing and disappearing? Yeah, Po Hui, that was what I was uh, just trying to uh, uh, show with the example of a river uh, something can change continuously but it does not have to completely disappear like I am changing all the time you see as you look at me you see my mouth moving but I don't have to completely disappear and then appear again and then completely disappear and then appear again yeah so uh, the examples I use is like a, a lamp that is flickering on off on off on off that is a type of change that involves disappearance the thing completely goes and then comes up again but the type of this is not the only type of change that we have and the way how the early discourses conceptualize impermanence and present it to us the theory of momentariness is not yet there and according to Van Rosbach, yeah, I was not remembering his name, a colleague of mine who has written a whole book on the theory of momentariness, even at the stage of the canonical Abhidharma, momentariness is not yet there. So according to his uh, research, the theory of momentariness is post-canonical Abhidharma. So Hugo what is the meaning of noble? What does it cover in the context of the suttas? Yeah, Arya in the discourses usually uh, uh, the closest connection we always have is to the stages of awakening. The Arya Savaka, the noble disciple, is the one who is at the very least on the path to stream entry, but usually one who has attained one of the four stages of awakening. That is the most common and strongest uh, nuance of nobility uh, that we get in the suttas and this obviously introduces us to a conception of nobility that is based on mental purification in contrast to the sense of nobility that is based on belonging to a particular caste or being born from a particular family. Rosa Grau, in the first sermon Arya could not be there as the noble ones were not yet there Well, the Buddha was already a noble one at that point, and if my hypothesis should be correct, then the signification that nobility in relation to the Four Noble Truths had at the outset was closely related to the Buddha. Nevertheless, I, I agree that in the first sermon, the qualification Arya was probably not there. That is the point that uh, I think Norman is correct in that. That is the point that Sylvester had already spotted all on his own without needing to read up. I had to read up before I found out. <laughs> I didn't notice it myself. <laughs> uh, John Emma wants the name of the person that wrote on the momentariness. That takes a little while, but I'll get it to you. <clears throat> I don't find the full title of Andrew's John Emma, but I can just say it's his name. Alexander von Rosbart and 
I, I have a PDF somewhere, but now if I start looking for the PDF, it's going to take a little long and everybody has to wait. It's something on momentariness is in the title. Anyway, I can, I can, I can, I can check that up later. The Buddha never called the no is never called the noble one in the suttas, as far as I remember. But uh, Rosa, can you can you just look here the quote I gave in Pali? Excuse me. <laughs> It says the the target is a noble one, therefore the noble truths are so called. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, Rosa, I, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter, no? We can just, uh, there, there, there is this passage here, and, and I, I, I believe, I mean, this is the only, only passage where, uh, I, we cannot take out Arya, because then there's, uh, no more meaning to the statement, and this is why I believe that in this case, we, Arya must be original, or, the whole sutta must be late, otherwise it wouldn't work. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, this is Anayo, he can't stop. So here we go, John Emmer, there you go. Alexander von Rospa, the Buddhist doctrine of momentariness, a survey of the origin and early phase of this doctrine up to Vashu Bandhu, Stuttgart von Steiner Verlag. <laughs> <laughs> this Anayo is terrible. <laughs> it really bugs me if I don't have the references at hand. <laughs> Okay, sorry to everybody one else, but that was the chance also for you to ask any questions. <clears throat> and now we continue. Let me just drink a little bit of water. So now we get into the arising of Dukkha. <clears throat> what venerable friends is the noble truth of the arising of Dukkha due to the arising of craving? Living beings truly have craving associated with the six internal sense bases, with the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. When there is craving, affection, defilement and attachment associated with these, that is called arising. Excuse me. Venerable friends, a learned noble disciple knows, thus I understand this teaching, thus I see it, thus I comprehend it, thus I contemplate it, thus I realize it. This is what is called the noble truth of the rising of Dukkha due to the rising of craving. <clears throat> How does the he, that is the noble disciple, know it thus? If there is craving for one's wife, children, male and female servants, messengers, retainers, fields, houses, shops, income and wealth. If when working on behalf of them there is craving, affection, defilement and attachment, then this is called arising. This is how he knows this noble truth of the rising of Dukkha due to the rising of craving. Yeah, in the Pali version we get just a very short statement. And it's interesting that this short statement in the Pali version mentions three types of craving. The craving for sensuality, for becoming or existence and for annihilation or non-existence. And these are rarely how often we do not find these three mentioned in the Chinese Agamas. It's something that, that really puzzled me when I came across that first time. And we can see how from this still relatively short uh, exposition in the Majjhima now we get a very, very detailed thing where we get this whole description which uh, 
hopefully you don't understand this to mean that only m males can have craving because it's all from a man's perspective but <laughs> I think it is also meant to apply to women <laughs> who then have to exchange this and say if there's craving for one's husband or partner or whatever <laughs> and then we get the application to the external sense objects and again to contact feeling perception volition and as Rosa Grau rightly pointed out, the puzzling reference to craving, if there's craving for craving. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and we get the six elements, special for Ronaldo. So any type of craving is the arising of Dukkha in some. Oh yeah, also I have, I have actually the translation of the Pali version. So, craving which brings renewal of being, accompanied by delight and lust, delights in this and that, that is craving for sense pleasures, for being and for non-being. Yeah, Mark, uh, this passage clearly outlines the link between craving and dukkha as it acts through the aggregates. Therefore, the aggregates themselves without the craving are not inherently dukkha, correct? I would agree with that, Mark. Are not experienced as dukkha. The the, the other hand only has the five aggregates. They are still unsatisfactory. They are still not able to give lasting satisfaction even for an other hand. But they are no longer experienced as... Uh, uh, they no longer lead to the type of dukkha that comes out of craving. But this is a debated issue. So this is just my, my personal take. I have written on that also somewhere, if I only knew where. I think in that from craving to liberation somewhere. From grasping to emptiness. I have these two books with collections of my encyclopedia articles that you can download as PDFs from my list of publication and uh, in regard to craving or clinging, but I think clinging, it must be clinging, grasping, clinging, upadana. I discuss also the relationship to uh, in the case of, of an Arahant, so you might find a little bit more there. Rene says that uh, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta offers a longer explanation. Yeah, in fact, I, I think we having here a manifestation of the same phenomena in discourses of different traditions. That is, uh, the beginning of uh, Abhidharma type of commentary becoming part of a discourse. And in the present case, in the case of the Satchavibhanga Sutta, we get this in the Madhyama Agama version, but not in the Pali version and not in the Theravada version. And in the case of the Satipatthana Sutta, it goes other way around and we find this type of explanation has become part of the discourse. And the whole exposition on the Four Noble Truths, the detailed exposition that distinguishes the Diga Nikaya 22, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya Satipatthana Sutta, according to several scholars, is a case of edit, addition of a commentarial passage that has become part of the discourse during the course of all transmission. And that is also the perspective that I would take on them. It's a very fascinating course in that way. And if we get in time, we will get at another passage uh, that also shows that within the corpus of the early discourses, as we have early and later, sometimes we can catch the beginning of certain tendencies. And these, these passages point to the beginning of what later on became the, uh, an independent uh, type of text, uh, the Abhidharma. Wayne Cho. The aggregates have an underlying tendency to cause dukkha, no? And not to an other hand, I would say, Wayne. To the other hand would see the five aggregates as something that cannot give lasting satisfaction to him or her, but uh, they would not cause the type of dukkha, the type of uh, suffering in inverted commas that we are discussing in relation to the Four Noble Truth to an Arahant. It is the Panch Upadana Kanda, the clinging 
grasping to the five aggregates that is included in the first noble truth or first truth noble in brackets not uh, the five aggregates themselves but as i said this is being uh, this is a debated issue and uh, so uh, this is rene I agree with Wayne Cho in PTS Diganika 3829. The second truth has been explained in more detail. There, many aspects of the Khandas are described as dear, attractive, pleasant, and leading to craving. So, this second truth suggests that the Khandas are not always inherently suffering or unsatisfactory. However, I agree that at certain times they inevitably are dukkha, not lasting satisfaction. Here, Rene, the point of saying that something is unsatisfactory is not to say that it cannot be attractive and pleasant uh, for some time. The point is more that uh, because this pleasure or attraction does not last because things change, sooner or later uh, the pleasure is going to disappear and that is the unsatisfactoriness about it. Yeah, I think I continue. So the truth of cessation is in both versions described in a similar way as the arising. So now we get the, the path. What venerable friends is the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of Dukkha? It is this, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. What then, my friends, is right view? When the noble disciple is mindful of dukkha as dukkha, of its arising as its arising, of its cessation as its cessation, mindful of the past as the path, or when he contemplates his former actions, or when he trains to be mindful of all formations, or when he sees the danger in all formations, or when he sees the tranquility and calm of nirvana, or when he, free from attachment, mindfully contemplates the mind as liberated, Whatever there in this investigation, comprehensive investigation, successive investigation, investigation of phenomena, examination, comprehensive examination, observation, knowledge and realization, that is called right view. We have quite a different definition. Well, not quite a different definition, but there is a different element in the Madhyama Agama version, which I again think points us to the issue of uh, the beginning of Abhidhamic influences, and I have also written a paper on that. <laughs> yeah, the Sanhar has written a paper on everything, it seems, <laughs> that you can download from the uh, list of publications. It's on the Mahachatarisaka Sutta, Majjhima 117, where we get this very clear as a shift we find from the early discourses to uh, the slightly more abhidhamic perspectives where instead of describing like what right, my, right view is about which is in the first part here and in the Pali version we also or at some time even only get a description of how it happens in terms of the different mental factors that are there at that time and that is this later part we get here, investigation, comprehensive investigation, successive investigation. This is this, this Abhidharmic style of listing near equivalents in a way to, to map the state of mind that is having right view or arriving right view. And usually, not exclusively, this is then the type of right view experienced at the moment of the supramundane. Not here, not yet in this description, but that is the direction that these descriptions move into. Yeah, so if we look at the Pali version, we get uh, the same definition of the Noble Eightfold Path, but then we just get this, uh, uh, this, this fourfold knowledge, knowledge of the Four Noble Truth. That is right view. And then the Madhyama Arma continues throughout with this issue of when the noble is mindful of dukkha as dukkha, of arising as arising, etc., etc., the whole para that I read to you before, 
and then gives always this 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 listing of um, near equivalents, like mental thought, comprehensive thought, appropriate thought. I mean, when we have been translating this, we have been kind of struggling to find uh, different terms to show that there's always a different term which is actually saying the same thing. So here, right intention is mental thought, comprehensive thought, appropriate thought, thinking of what should be thought of, aspiring to what should be aspired to. This is called right intention. And in the Pali version, we get the same by, team, by, by way of actual object. What is the object of right intention? Not what is the state of mind of right intention, the uh, looking, looking inside to see what are the factors there, but what is, mind, what is right intention, what is it about? Renunciation, non ill will, and non cruelty. <coughs> and then again, right speech, we get the whole, and then uh, this, uh, in addition to the four kinds of good verbal contact, whatever constitutes abstaining and abandoning of every other kind of evil verbal conduct, not practicing it, not doing it, not condoning it, not associating with it. And instead, in the Pali version, we just get the for false verbal conduct, false speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, and idle chatter, to abstain from them. And then with right action, again the same, abstaining, abandoning, etc., etc. And in the Pi version, we, 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 we get uh, the, the, the three actions that one abstains from, killing, stealing, or abstaining, taking what is not given, and sexual, sex, sexual misconduct, misconduct in sensual pleasures. And here now we come to right livelihood. Whatever then is not seeking to make a livelihood by inappropriate means, nor out of excessive desire and dissatisfaction, nor by the various forms of wrong livelihood, such as performing tricks or incantations, but instead seeking ropes in a way that are in accordance with the Dharma, not contrary to the Dharma, Seeking food, beds, and seeds in ways that are in accordance with the Dharma, not contrary to the Dharma. This is called right livelihood. And this is uh, not yet does not yet have this uh, abhidharmic flavor, and this is actually quite helpful, I find, because in the Pali version we are not really being told what right livelihood is. It's just you you don't have wrong livelihood. Uh huh. Hmm. <laughs> I mean. Other passages then help us to draw out what is the meaning of right and wrong livelihood. But here in the Madhyama Agama version, and this is particularly being spoken of from the perspective of a monastic who goes maybe begging and who may use various things in order to uh, endear himself or herself with the lay supporters and then get better support. Then right effort, and again here we get a series of mental states, vigor, effort, unified, diligent striving, power in progressing, focused application without remission, without decline, rightly master the mind. Whereas in the Pali version we get the four right efforts. Here a bhikkhu, a monk, awakens zeal for the non-arising of unreasoned evil, unwholesome states, and makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And then for the abandoning of arisen unwholesome states, for the arising of unarisen wholesome states, and for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. Here also we get a little bit like effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. This uh, feature of <coughs> giving more than one term to say what in a normal discussion, we would say with one what is already found in the early discourses. This is part of the oral transmission where if we say the same thing, like if I say it was good, but if I say it was good, very nice, enchanting, beautiful, enrapturing, then there are so many different terms, it's more sure that the idea that I'm trying to get across doesn't get lost. But we find that with the Abhidharma, and again, this is these are just stages that we can see here. With the later Abhidharma, usually when we look at the canonical Abhidharma, we, a particular word is defined by giving a register, a long list of all 
terms that in some way are related or similar or near synonyms. Right mindfulness, <clears throat> now it gets interesting. So whatever there is, the mind's concordance with mindfulness, it's turning away from non-mindfulness, it's being comprehensively mindful, recollecting and again recollecting, the mind's being straight, non-forgetfulness of what the mind is responding to, this is called right mindfulness. In the Pali version, instead, we get the four satipatthanas, contemplating body, feeling, mental states and dharmas. And this same uh, different in perspective, then comes with right concentration. Whatever there is, the mind stability is being established in the absorptions, established accordingly, being unwavering and not scattered, being focused, stilled and rightly concentrated. This is called right concentration. And the Pali version instead gives a description of the four absorptions. Yeah, and uh, Madhyama Agama then concludes with a verse which we don't have in Pali. The Buddha has clearly comprehended all things. He has seen the countless wholesome and meritorious qualities. The truth of Dukkha, its arising, its cessation and the path, skillfully revealing and explaining them. So if we leave aside now all these... Um, a little bit more academic observations that we made about beginning of Abhidharma, about noble and so on, and just try to come to something very practical, some gist around there, as we are also coming to a conclusion of our exploration of the four noble truths. There's Dukkha. Craving is the one condition that can be changed. The cessation of craving is freedom. And the practice, the path towards that freedom, combines bodily restraint with mental cultivation. <clears throat> this is just my summary, and you are totally free. That could be your homework, if you like homework, for you to summarize what is the essence of the four truths, the four noble truths, from a practical perspective. Yeah, if you are not too tired and there are not too many questions that my presentation so far has aroused, I will take a quick jump into the next discourse. Because the thing is also that we only have two more. Are we allowed to print the PDFs? The PDFs that I put up of the lectures, you can, you can certainly uh, print out and you can also download those there's no problem about that the only thing that you are asked not to download are the videos of these lectures if possible and everything that I'm showing to you will be up on the on the on the website on the OLAT side yeah we, we have come to a conclusion of the four novel truths now and we only have two more lectures to go and there is a whole second chapter that I would like to at least brush through and um, it's actually not so bad that we don't have so much time for it because the topic of this uh, chapter is what is marvelous and wonderful and what uh, ancient Indians found marvelous and wonderful is not necessarily what we would find marvelous and wonderful and so in the remaining uh, 15 minutes that I still have, I would like to go to do a quick run through the first of these discourse on wonderful and marvelous qualities, because that leaves us some space next time to get into, after a quick look at 33, to get into Madhyama, Madhyama Agama 34, because there we get a picture of an arahant, uh, that, as far as I can see, uh, differs to some degree from the description of an Arahant in other early discourses. And that discourse, again, I would like to take up in more detail because this relates to the second of the two main topics in our, in this year's lecture series, the Arahant and the Four Truth. <coughs> So I, yeah, never mind what the live difference in, in introductions are.
but the two discourses are spoken by Ananda, the chief disciple of the Buddha who acted as his attendant, as his personal attendant. And he uh, describes what he thinks is particularly marvelous and wonderful about his teacher, about the Buddha. And this theme of marvelous and wonderful qualities continues. We will get uh, arahants that are marvelous and wonderful. We will get the Dharma. And we also get a number of lay people who are marvelous and wonderful in this chapter. So, a uh, real discovery for me was this first quality in the Madhyama Agama version. Blessed One, I have heard that at the time of Kasapa Buddha, the Blessed One made his initial vow to follow the path of becoming a Buddha and practice the holy life. And then he repeats that at the time of Kasapa Buddha, the Blessed One made his initial vow to follow the path of becoming a Buddha and practice the holy life. This I remember as an extraordinary quality of the Blessed One. And then um, the discourse continues. It repeats this marvel of the initial vow and continues. And then he was reborn in two-seater heaven. And this I remember as a wonderful quality. And then he made his initial vow and uh, he was reborn in the two-seater heaven. And in two-seater heaven he excelled uh, the other devas by the length of his life, his complexion and his glory. And the two Siddha gods were delighted about it. So the qualities that we get in Madhyama Agama discourse are like this. You get quality number one, this initial vow, then one and two together, one, two, three together, and from then on you get you get single qualities. And I've discussed this in detail in my book on the genesis of the Bodhisattva ideal, and this this particular indication is a, is a key key passage in my argument there and uh, this as the other PDFs you can freely download it either from my list of publications or I think I also posted it on OLAT. Basically what this shows us is uh, the beginning of this idea that the Buddha in a past life took a vow with the idea of becoming a Buddha. If we uh, and I can't make the full argument here now in the few minutes that are left. So if you are interested in this uh, conception of the Bodhisattva, I, I in, happily invite you to, to read through my book and, and see if that makes any sense to you. But <clears throat> in the early discourses, the term Bodhisattva uh, is used, except for this Marvel discourse, is used mainly to speak of the Buddha doing the last of his, his present lifetime, his last lifetime, his quest for awakening. And this idea that is uh, so common in all Buddhist traditions, that one prepares oneself over past eons through cultivating wholesome qualities with this aspiration of becoming a Buddha in the future, is a, clearly a later development. And this later development, uh, I just need to mention, is also found in the Theravada tradition. The Theravada tradition has a Bodhisattva path. It has, uh, rec this is recognized in the commentaries and throughout history of Theravada Buddhism, there have been repeatedly even high politicians and monastics who aspire and practice this path of the Bodhisattva. And even nowadays, in the Theravada tradition, many eminent monks are following the Bodhisattva path. So this is not something we can put uh, into, uh, neatly pack it up into one tradition. The only distinction is that in the Mahayana traditions, the following of the Bodhisattva path is basically the only option that is seen as really valid. But this whole development has begun after the historical period that is reflected in the early discourses. And uh, so far, scholars have not been able to push back further into the past from what we call the early Mahayana suttas. And with this particular passage and a few others that I have put together in this book, I have tried to link early Buddhism with early Mahayana in particular and to show how this idea 
of uh, being a bodhisattva over a prolonged period, more than one rebirth, aspiring to become a Buddha, how this gradually evolved. And this whole discourse on marvels and wonders is particularly telling to show us the kind of need that was there after the Buddha had passed away. The need of the people to create some kind of relationship to this person who was just gone. And the uh, kind of devotion that came with that. And then this, 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 this idea, and here we have really, I think, the beginning stage that, uh, uh, and it is logical, Kasapa Buddha is the, uh, last Buddha, just the one before the present Buddha, that the idea was that at that time he had uh, our Buddha, Shakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, made, uh, took this decision, I'm, I'm going to become a Buddha in future myself. But uh, soon enough this decision was put further back into the past to another Buddha called Dipankara. Yeah, I think I stop here on this topic. I just invite you, if, if you are interested, to 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 look this up in my book where I give the discussion in much more detail. And then we get various other um, marvelous qualities. And the thing uh, that is interesting is that while both the Pali version and the Madhyama Agam version present the same type of attitude towards the Buddha, the actual marvels, <coughs> excuse me, that they describe are different. There's considerable differences. So it seems that the similar topic has been developed in different ways. So this is still, this is the Pali version. I'm not going to read it because we are a little short of time. It's all on this two-seater heaven, the last life before he became a human. So here we have uh, uh, when the Blessed One Mindful descended into his mother's womb. At that moment, all of heaven and earth trembled. A great light illuminated the world, including even remote and dark places, unobstructed, completely shining on places that are not illuminated by the moon or the sun. Even though these possess great supernormal power, great and mighty virtue, great merit and great and mighty power. Because of this wonderful light, each and every sentient being came to know this. A remarkable being will be born. A remarkable being will be born. And then another marvel is that while he was in his mother's womb, the Blessed One remained mindfully lying on his right side. And he dwelt in his mother's womb peacefully and at ease. And he was covered in such a way that he was not defiled by blood or semen or other impurities. Yeah. So here we have a similar marvel, number five. I'm not going to read it in detail to you, but again we get this light manifesting and everybody can see each other and they realize uh, that something, something extraordinary is happening and the whole earth quakes. And uh, then uh, some different uh, marvels, like there are these four young deities who guard him. And the mother becomes very virtuous as soon as the Bodhisattva is in her womb. And she has no sensual thoughts, but she is totally happy all the time. And she has no affliction. And she's able to see him within her womb. Just like one can see a, a string that is, is going through a barrel gem. In the same way she can see the Bodhisattva in her womb. <clears throat> so here we are again with the Madhyama Agama list of marvels. So when the mind, Blessed One mindfully came out from his mother's womb, at that moment all of heaven and earth trembled. And we're going to get the great light, and uh, people realize that a remarkable being has been born. And then uh, he came out of the womb peacefully and at ease. And when he came out from his mother's wombs, he was covered in such a way that he was not defiled by blood or semen or other impurities. 
And when he was just born, then four gods holding extremely fine pieces of cloth <coughs> stood before his mother and delighted her by exclaiming, This prince is most wonderful, most remarkable. He possesses great supernormal power, great and mighty virtue, great merit and great and mighty power. And when he was just born right away, the Blessed One immediately took seven steps and without fear, trepidation or apprehension looked in all directions. And then when he was born, there appeared before his mother a large pond brimful of water with which she was able to cleanse herself. And when he was just born, two streams of water, one cool and one warm, poured down from the sky to bathe the Blessed One's body. And the gods in the sky are making music and throwing lotuses and other flowers. Yeah, then in the Pali version test that we are told that the mother died seven days after the birth of the Bodhisattva. And I'm showing in my study that this is a later edition because it comes out of sequence. And that she gave birth to him exactly after ten months. And that she gave birth to him standing. And that he was first received by gods and not by human beings. And that he did not touch the earth, but he was received by gods. And uh, the gods said to the mother, Rejoice. And he was uh, totally clean. And here too, as in the other version, even though he was totally clean, we get these two streams of water, which one cool and one warm, for bathing him and his mother. And here too also he takes seven steps, and with the white parcel held over him, he looks at each quarter and utters the words of the leader of the herd. I am the highest in the world, I am the best in the world, I am the foremost in the world, this is my last birth, now there is no renewal of being for me. <coughs> This is another passage that I exploit in quite some detail in my book because here the qualities of an Arahant who is fully awakened are attributed to the Bodhisattva at the time when he was just being born, when he still had to eradicate all of his defilements, which shows again a shift in the Bodhisattva conception. And we get again the great light and the thousandfold world system shook and trembled. <coughs> So, after all this talking, here we got a picture for you. That's a very early picture. It's uh, what we call an aniconic uh, depiction of the Buddha being born. That is, the Buddha is cannot be seen. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see the error that I'm using here. Let me see. There must be some error. There it is. Okay. Doom. There. Yeah. Can you see that little, like, 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 uh, like a bulging, bulging out on the side of the mother? This is, this is where she has just come out, where, where the Bodhisattva has just come out. And there, on that cloth, this arrow is a little difficult to manage, right? There, there are little footprints. So he has, he has just come out there from the, from the side of his mother. She is holding onto a tree and giving birth to him standing. And the footprints on the cloth show that he's being received and the stool below is just a sign of respect that signifies to us that the Buddha is there somewhere in the area above. He is not being depicted because it's an uniconic depiction. The Buddha is not being shown directly but only symbolically. And then there's these four devas who receive him. And this is just some lady attendant of Queen Maya. <clears throat> and here we get another depiction, and this time, whoops, let me get this arrow away. This time we have an iconic depiction. Here is the Bodhisattva, and he's, he's raising his hand. It's a little difficult to see, so I expect he's, he's making a pronouncement. And here's Queen Maya, obviously, holding on to the tree, and there are the two gods, and you can just see this. Don't know which one is the cold and which one is the warm uh, uh, water, but they are mixing the water to 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 bathe him. John Emmer asked if it was forbidden to depict the Buddha directly. I don't think it was like uh, there was an explicit rule against it, but in the early period of Indian art, it was felt inappropriate to depict the Buddha, and this is only a later development. 
So the earliest period we have the so-called aniconic uh, depictions. And now, just in time, we come to the last marvel. <coughs> and the Blessed One says, Ananda, remember furthermore this extraordinary quality of the Tathagata. Ananda, the Tathagata, is aware of feelings as they arise, remain, and pass away, being aware of them continuously, without a moment of being unaware of them. Ananda, the Tathagata, is aware of thoughts, of perceptions, as they arise, remain, and pass away, being aware of them continuously, without a moment of being unaware of them. Therefore, Ananda, remember furthermore this extraordinary quality of the Tathagata. So that's the Buddha stepping in himself. After Ananda has come out with his whole ology, he says, look, there's something really wonderful about me. Look, this is this. And we get a similar thing in the Pali version. Here also he says, for the Tathagata, feelings are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. <coughs> Excuse me. Perceptions are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. Thoughts are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. Remember this too, Ananda, as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Tathagata. So the main points that uh, we can derive from this discourse is, on the one hand, even though it may not be what we find inspiring, perhaps, <coughs> uh, uh, the discourse as it is reflects the importance of providing some inspiration particularly at a time when the Buddha had just passed away and the community of monastics and lay people was struggling for survival in ancient India. And the point that I like about this discourse, as you may have uh, may suspect, knowing this Analayo and his preferences, is obviously this last part. And this, I think, uh, may be the origin of this discourse, that Ananda in some way has been praising some external qualities of the Buddha, and the Buddha became aware of that and stepped in. Look, the really, what is really wonderful or marvelous is uh, meditative qualities, is awareness of impermanence. To know whatever feeling, perception, and thought there is, to be aware when it gets started, as long as it's there and when it disappears. That is really marvelous. Thank you very much for your attention. That's it for today, and I. I look forward to see you again in a week's time for some more marvels and wonderful qualities.